Good morning, Path Point. How are y'all this morning? I'll tell you what, God is so good, isn't he? Man, wasn't worship great? He's never lost a battle, y'all. He's never lost a single battle, and he's not about to start. If he hasn't lost one, why would he lose one now? Man, I tell you what, the anointing on that, he's never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. Well, no matter what battle you're going through right now, guess what? You're on God's side. You're his kid. Man, when my kid's going through something, man, I'm going to fight for him. And y'all better hope it's me because if Lily has to fight for him, y'all are in trouble. I tell you what, God's the same way. He's going to fight for you. And he's never lost a battle. So if he's never lost a battle, then you won't lose the battle either. You just got to stay in the game, y'all. Just stay in the game. The battle's already been won. Just keep going. Keep pressing forward into what God has for you. Amen? Amen. Man. Well, if you don't know me, my name's David Simmons. I'm so excited to be here this morning. Pastors, thank you for the opportunity to be up here again. You know, I always have to start by honoring my pastors. Don't y'all love our pastors? Yes. See, I'm a PK. PK means a pastor's kid or a preacher's kid. I was raised in the church, and I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff, man. And I know what pastors go through, and I just, I just want to tell them I love them and appreciate them. And they love you. They pray for you daily. Did you know Pastor Scott has a book with the members' names in it? And he prays for you. He looks at your face, and he prays specifically for you by name and by your face, y'all. I've never seen that. That is so special. We have wonderful pastors, and I'm so thankful for them. Amen. Pastor, do you want to say anything before I go? Okay, then I'm going to take it away. Really quickly, I want to remind you, a week from today is our Christmas Eve candlelight service. All right, we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to do it the same time as a normal Sunday experience, 1030 a.m., one week from today. It's still going to be really special, y'all. We've been planning on this for quite a while. Uh, so we're going to invite your kids to come in. There won't be children's uh, because the kids are going to sing a song with us. They're going to help us lead worship. we got a kid's choir. In fact, that reminds me, if your kids are in that choir, stay after church. We're having a little rehearsal today, okay? <laughs> but it's going to be a blast, and it's going to be really special. So bring your family and your friends, those that come with you. It's just a great way to center ourselves on Christ before we dig into all the holiday celebrations. I just love that time where I can just be with my family and just say, you know what, this is the reason we celebrate Christmas. Amen. So come one week from today. Two weeks from today is New Year's Eve. Same thing, 1030 a.m. right here. But we're going to be talking about Prophecy 24. Amen. Pastor Scott's going to be giving us the word of the Lord for 24. Are you excited about that, y'all? It's going to be really good. You don't want to miss it. He's doing it early. Sometimes he makes us wait till like February or March, and it's like, oh, come on, I want to know. But this year, he's going to give it to us right on time, okay? It's going to be great. We're going to love it, okay? Now, I want to remind you, too, remember the Connect cards that Pastor Scott had you fill out a couple of weeks ago that said, you know, what is it that if it wasn't in your life, it'd be a miracle? Or what, if the, what would it be that happened in your life that would be a miracle? Write it down, because that's interacting with the kingdom of God. I want you to hold on to those Connect cards, okay? Because two weeks at Prophecy 24, Pastor Scott's going to give you special instructions. So take these two weeks to build your faith, speak over it, and be prepared to see that miracle come to pass in 24. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, well, we're going to get started today with a question. How many of you all like Christmas movies? Anybody in here? Oh, man, quite a few people. I know we've all got a few bah humbugs in the room that don't like Christmas movies. Okay. But you know... I just love a good Christmas story. There's something we can all relate to in the ups and the downs and the highs and lows and the craziness that comes with family. In fact, childhood memories come flooding to my mind when I see the story of that young boy named Ralphie. Do you all remember him? <laughs> he just wanted an official Red Ryder carbine action 200-shot uh, range model air rifle, right, with the compass in the stock and the thing that tells time. And what did everybody tell him? You'll shoot your eye out. Oh, man. Uh, he reminds me so much of me. I had an imagination like that when I was a boy. Lily says, was a boy? Mm. 
Or maybe, maybe you're more inspired by John McClain saving yeah. Christmas from the terrorists, right? Man, yippee Kaye, there you go. <laughs> What's more Christmas than saving the world from terrorists, right? I mean, that's pretty much what Jesus did, right? Okay. He saved the world from the devil. And uh, so, it, just so y'all know, I do think Die Hard's a Christmas movie. So, y'all can debate amongst yourselves, okay? All right. And of course, our hearts are always warmed when we take the journey every year with the young Charlie Brown, who's simply trying to find out what Christmas is all about. See, these tales and many more, they shape our childhood sometimes. They shape our Christmas traditions. But you know the greatest thing? The whole reason all of these stories exist is because of the original Christmas story, the one they call the greatest story ever told. See, it's a story that's full of drama and intrigue and daring escapes and divine encounters. See, truth is more, is more crazy than fiction sometimes. And we're going to see that today because we're going to look at the Christmas story today. Do you all want to look at the Christmas story with me today? I know you've heard it before, but we're going to look at it again, maybe in a way that you've not looked at it, okay? So we're going to start in a place you've probably not started before. We're not going to start in Luke or Matthew. We'll get there eventually. But we're going to start instead in Galatians, all right? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, this scripture has a lot to say, but firstly, what always caught my eye when I'd read this is where it says the fullness of time. Ooh, that's always been intriguing to me. What does that mean, the fullness of time? And so I began to pray and I began to study this over the last couple of weeks. And I said, you know what? Let's talk about the fullness of time. But in order to learn what that is, we've got to actually go back to the beginning of time. And so if we go back to the beginning of time and we talk about Adam and Eve, you all remember Adam and Eve. They're there in the garden. They had everything. But like so many in this day and age, they were deceived, weren't they? They were tricked into thinking that what they had wasn't enough that there was more out there for them, that God was holding out on them. He was keeping things from them. And once they realized it, guess what? They'd been duped. It was too late, wasn't it? They'd lost everything, not only for themselves, but for all of mankind. Thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. Yeah, appreciate that. You see, now the authority that God had given Adam was gone, and he had traded it to the serpent for a piece of fruit. And Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, and a curse was pronounced on them. They went from sons to slaves, slaves to sin, slaves to the wages of sin. And the presence of God that Adam had enjoyed for years, maybe even centuries, it went silent. How many times have we traded something good for a sham? Anybody ever made that mistake like Adam and Eve? You had something really good, and then for some reason you thought you saw something better. The grass just seemed a little greener, and you traded it only to realize, "Uh uh-oh, I think I got tricked into that. Well, Adam and Eve definitely know your pain. But the good news is God already had a plan. He wasn't surprised. He wasn't taken aback. He had a plan, and immediately he sets forth his plan. In fact, he says his plan to that old serpent in Genesis 3.15. He tells the serpent, and I will place great hostility between you and the woman and between her seed and yours. He will crush your head as you crush his heel. Thus, the very first prophecy of the coming Messiah was brought forth by God himself. He speaks forth this prophecy and tells Satan, there's gonna come a day when the seed of the woman will crush you. Now, immediately, the old serpent tries to stop God's plans, and he must think, well, Cain and Abel, Abel is here serving God. It must be Abel. And so when Cain slays Abel, I'm sure he thought that he'd stopped God. But here's the thing. God had a much bigger plan called the fullness of time, and it was a whole lot bigger than Adam and Eve and then Cain and Abel. You see, today what we're going to do is I've asked the guys to put a timeline up for us. How many of y'all like timelines? Yay, I mean, that's not quite as much as Die Hard, but we're almost there, okay? 
But here's what we're going to do. We're going to see the fullness of time today, okay? And what we're going to do is follow the plan of God throughout the generations and how he worked this plan. Because you see, fullness means completion. It means completion, wholeness. We might even say alignment. See, in order for God's plan to come to pass, the timing, the conditions, the setting, the locale, everything had to be perfect. Fullness of time, alignment, So all throughout the Old Testament, we watch this story of God's fullness of time. It unfolds before us. Through Abraham, we see that God chooses for himself a special people, and he calls them the children of Israel. And through them, he raises mighty men of valor. And the people wonder, oh, will this be the Messiah? And he raises up mighty men like Moses who performed great miracles and delivers his people out of slavery. He raises men like Samson, a man of superhuman strength who can slay armies with a donkey's jawbone. He raises men like David, the young king who slays giants. See, he raises these men up in his plan for the fullness of time. Because here's the thing is that God, he knows the end from the beginning, doesn't he? See, this is where we get tripped up as humans. We can only see what's in front of us. And so we're looking at it, and they were looking at it from the beginning to the end. But let me tell you something. God, he's all the way over here on the timeline. You see what I'm saying? To him, listen to this, to him, the future is the past. Uh, That'll blow your mind there for a second. If you think about it, to him, the future has already happened. It's the past. And so I think about Moses and Samson and David. And yes, God had plans for their lives, didn't he? He had a special plan for David. He had a special plan for Moses. But you see, his plan wasn't just for David. It wasn't just for Moses. His plan was much bigger than them. This is why Pastor Scott has been telling us we've got to take our minds off the temporal things. We've got to look at the eternal things because, yes, God has a plan for your life. He has great things for you, but it's not just for your life. There's so much more. His plan is the fullness of time. His plan is through eternity. He already sees the future. He sees beyond you. He sees beyond your kids and your grandkids, and he has a plan for all of them for all eternity. Man, talk about a big God. Don't you want to see what his plans are? Yes, the fullness of time. Now, continuing our story, through Solomon's son, Rehoboam, we know this story. Satan's able to divide the kingdom through him, isn't he? If you all remember Rehoboam, he's the new king, Solomon's son, and the people come before him and they say, oh, King Rehoboam, listen, brother, Saul was a good king and everything. But that dude was hard on us, man. He taxed us. He, he worked us in his armies. He was hard. Tell you what, will you please go easy on us, give us a break, and we'll follow you forever. Now, y'all know that I'm totally summarizing this, right? Okay, just making sure. And so Rehoboam goes, and he asks Solomon's old advisors and his wise men. He says, what do you think? And they say, listen, he was hard on them. Y'all need to listen to the people. And he said, you need to to do what they say. And this is a golden opportunity for you to win the people. So then he goes to the young men, his contemporaries, the guys that are with him, his buddies and his pals. And he says, what do you think we should do? And they say, don't listen to those boomers, man. They don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, you need to follow our advice. And you need to tell those people, you better do what I say or I'll be twice as hard as my father was. And, of course, we know what happened. The kingdom rebelled and was split in half. Now we have the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. And, of course, immediately the northern kingdom falls into idolatry. And the Lord tries sending prophets to them, and they either A, ignore them, or B, kill them if they don't like what they have to say. And so they don't listen, and they are turned over to destruction. And in 700 B.C., The northern kingdom falls to the Assyrian Empire. And 135 years later, the southern kingdom, Judah, falls to the Babylonians. Now, the serpent must have thought right here, oh, I've surely won by now. You know, I've really stopped God's plans. But let me tell you something. God's never lost a battle. 
He's never lost a battle. We just sang that. And here's the thing. I got to kick over a religious cow here, if y'all don't mind for a second. All right, here's the thing. Religion has showed us, and I don't know if it's been on purpose, but they've showed us, well, God is good and God is light and God is here. And Satan is the opposite of God. He's darkness and he's evil and he is here. But God, uh, Satan is nowhere near the level of God, okay? He is far, far below God. He is a created being. He's an angel. He is not anywhere close to the same level of, as God. And let me tell you something a little bit more. If you're a child of God, the Bible says that when Christ was raised from the dead, seated in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father in the place of authority, it says we were raised together with him. Satan is under our feet. He's not even equal with you. So why would we think he's equal with God? He's far even below your feet. The only authority and the only power that he has in our lives is the one that we give him. And if we tell him no way, then listen, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. So he might have thought he'd won because God's people now have been scattered and they've been exiled, taken to Babylon. But let me tell you, God had a plan called the fullness of time. You see, the people now, they begin to repent and they look for a savior, a deliverer, a Messiah. They turn their hearts back to God. And now they go and they read after the prophets again and say, well, gosh, maybe that Isaiah guy that we saw it in half, maybe he was right. Maybe we should have listened to him because he foretold the exile. But he also foretold this prophecy in Isaiah 9. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So they begin to look for this Messiah. Then new prophets like Daniel arise, and Daniel has this vision. And behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So the people turn their hearts back to Jehovah, and miraculously, the people are returned to their homeland. Now, this had never happened before in the history of mankind, in the history of humanity. This kingdom, they were scattered, taken away, shattered, and then a century or two later, they're taken back to their homeland. This had never happened before in human history. And the interesting thing is, not only did it happen once for the children of Israel, it happened twice. They were exiled again when the the Romans sacked Jerusalem and then the Crusaders scattered them. But in 1948, they were returned to their homeland again, fulfilling yet another prophecy that I don't have time to get into today, okay? So let's just keep moving, all right? But they're returned to their homeland. We remember Nehemiah. They're there building the city of Jerusalem, building the walls back up. But something interesting happens here. Though they were in their homeland, a great silence fell upon the land. There were no prophets, no kings, no great leaders, no Messiah. For 400 years, we call this the years of silence. 400 years. Imagine that. You know, if God doesn't speak to us for two weeks, we're like, oh, what's going on, God? Oh, 23 was a tough year. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if this faith thing works. I don't know. I don't know, God. I don't. 400 years of silence. But I'm going to tell you something. The fullness of time. The fullness of time. See, now, because of its location, the land of Israel is of significant strategic economic and political importance. It still is today. And it was consequently traded from one conquering kingdom to the next. It went from the Babylonians to the Medo-Persians to the Macedonians and the Greeks. And finally, it went to the greatest empire the world had ever seen to that point, Rome. Now, here's what's interesting here. Because even though Rome was a very cruel taskmaster, a hard empire to live in, it ushered in something else the world had never seen, 
something called the Pax Romana. Anybody ever heard of this? It means the Roman peace, the Roman peace. And here's what happened. You see, even though they were mean and hard and they conquered people, within the empire, they built great cities. They were masterful uh, civil engineers. They built cities, they built aqueducts, they built shipping lanes, and they built roads all throughout the Roman empire. I found this picture on Google. Somebody took Google Maps. These are all roads that you can still walk today. These roads are still in existence that the Romans built. But they built these roads all over the empire, and the soldiers, the armies of Rome, secured these roads, secured the shipping lanes. So you literally could walk from Judea to Egypt and into Africa if you wanted. You could walk east into Iran or Iraq. You could go north into Syria and Turkey. I dare say you couldn't even walk those roads today. You could go all the way into Spain, all the way to Britain. And you could do it in relative peace and security because the soldiers guarded the roads. You didn't have to worry about pirates, robbers, or highwaymen, or local tribes, or militia. You could walk those roads in peace. Now, here's what's interesting, because this was a great feat of the Roman civilization, but it wasn't for Rome's glory. It was for God's glory. Because you see, those very roads that they built were the very roads that the Apostle Paul would use to carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ all the way out throughout the Roman Empire. They built those roads just for Paul to carry the gospel, just for the apostles. So it wasn't for the glory of Rome. It was for the glory of God, wasn't it? I love to watch the fullness of time. God's plan is is playing out. See, these days of silence are now about to end because the stage has been set. The fullness of time has been come, and God is about to unveil his majestic plan. And our story unfolds in an unusual way, because if you think about God, he's always going to do it in the way you least expect, doesn't he? Because they were looking for somebody maybe that would come to Rome and defeat the emperor and be a conqueror and a warrior. And yet when the Messiah came, he came to an unknown city, to an unknown teenage girl named Mary. Now, we're going to read the Christmas story together, but I figured, you know, I'm not a great narrator. We have a wonderful narrator on our staff, and her name is Pastor Suzanne. So, Pastor Suzanne, if you would please narrate our story for us. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting was this. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how how can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Crinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. 
All right. I'm going to interrupt for just a moment, okay? We're going to continue. But I, I need to point out two things right here. Two prophecies were ful fulfilled in this scripture that she just read. The first one is the virgin shall conceive. Isaiah prophesied this when he said this will be a sign to you that the virgin will conceive and will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The second prophecy was one found in Micah where he says that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. But here's the thing that is very interesting about this prophecy. Nobody actually knew this. They had forgotten it in the years of silence. And the reason we know this is because if you read Matthew's account of the Christmas story, you'll find that when the wise men go to Herod and they say, Herod, where is to be born the king of the Jews that we may worship him? It freaks Herod out. It says it troubled Herod greatly and all of Jerusalem. And so he had to gather his chief priests and his scribes, and they had to research, where is this baby to be born? And they found out it was to be born in Bethlehem. But here's another interesting thing is that Mary and Joseph don't live in Bethlehem. Remember the, the beginning of the story we just read said the angel appeared to her in Nazareth. Nazareth is where they live. Nazareth is 100 miles from Bethlehem. So they don't even know Jesus is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And also, Mary just happens to be nine months pregnant. Now, you ladies tell me, what would be worse, to walk 100 miles? Or maybe if you could take a donkey taxi, you could ride a donkey for 100 miles. Man, both of those sound pretty miserable, don't they? So they had no reason to go to Bethlehem. They didn't know. And who would want to travel at nine months pregnant? And yet, it just so happens, coincidentally, the emperor of Rome himself, Caesar Augustus, he decides that he's going to make a census so that he can get tax money. And it just so happens that it requires everyone to go to their birth city, Joseph being born in Bethlehem. And it just so happens that this happens right when Mary is due to give birth. He says, go to Bethlehem for the tax money. You see, Caesar was unconsciously obeying the will of God because there was a fullness of time. There was a plan involved. And you see, he might have been thinking, I'm going to get me some tax money. But what he didn't know, he was actually fulfilling a 700-year-old prophecy. It's called unconscious obedience. Sometimes when the king and the boss makes a decision that inconveniences us, maybe before we gripe and complain, maybe we should think, I wonder if God isn't going to fulfill a prophecy in my life. Come on, Amen. Amen. All right, let's continue our story. Pastor Dan, will you finish reading for us? So it was, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths laying in the manger. And suddenly there was an angel with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Can we hear it for Pastor Suzanne? Thank you, Pastor Suzanne. Isn't she a great narrator? Yes. Now, let me read this last line again. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
See, the silence was shattered with the sound of angels singing praises. The darkness was broken with the very glory of God filling the atmosphere. 400 years of silence. No word from God, no prophet, no promises, just conquest and turmoil, darkness and silence. The people had forgotten the promise. But in the darkest night, the fullness of time had come and God unveiled his plans. Those mysteries that had been held back for the people. Now those prophecies made sense. Now hope was born for the Messiah had come and is now here. I want to encourage you today, remember your prophecy. Remember your dream. Remember the words that God has spoken over you in your life. See, sometimes when we go through a period of silence and we don't see confirmation, we don't see our dreams coming to pass, sometimes we forget about them in the silence. But just because you've forgotten doesn't mean God has. Just because it's dark and just because it's silent doesn't mean God isn't working. In fact, that's when he's working the most. We learned a couple of weeks ago about the fruit tree, that in the dark, cold days of winter, when it seems like the tree is dead, it seems like the tree is unproductive, that's when it's the most productive of the entire season. That's when it's drawing its roots deep and drawing in the sap to prepare for the harvest. Sometimes you just need to let patience have its perfect work. Sometimes you just need to wait for the fullness of time to come. Amen? Reignite the spark and reignite the flame and let it come to pass. Remember our very beginning scripture, it said this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. You see, we watched the journey. We watched Abraham and David and Moses and Samson and all those men that God was playing out this grand theater, this grand play as he was preparing the fullness of time. And the stage and the settings had to be perfect. You think about Rome and the roads that were built. And Caesar had to make the decree at the exact perfect time. Here's another thing that happened. In those 400 years of silence, there was a group of men that got together and they said, we need to preserve the written history. We need to preserve our texts. And so they compiled the ancient texts in, in the Hebrew and in the Aramaic, not knowing that when Christ was born, those texts, they're called the Masoretic texts, they would become the foundation for our Old Testament just at the right time, in those 400 years of silence, those scriptures were be pre- being prepared so that when Paul went forth, he had those texts in his hand. Y'all, God is a master planner. The fullness of time had come. He told Satan, I'm going to crush your head, brother. And he did. When Jesus was born on that dark night, this prophecy was fulfilled that very first Christmas. See, the seed of the woman was born, not the seed of man, not man's plans, not man's designs. No, he placed Christ into her womb and she was born of God's plans and of God's designs. And he had come to destroy the works of the devil. And of course, we know that isn't the end of our story. Jesus went on to raise the dead and heal the sick and set at liberty the captives. He went on to become the lamb of God, didn't he? He died for our sins. He was sacrificed for us. But you know what? That's still not the end because he was raised up alive forevermore. And there's more fullness of time to come. There's more prophecy to be fulfilled. In fact, I'm going to look at one more scripture in Isaiah. 2,700-year-old prophecy. Isaiah says this, And on this mountain he will destroy the shroud wrapped around all people, the veil spread over all nations. It is the gloom of death. He will swallow it up in victory forever. And God, Lord Yahweh, will wipe away every tear from every face. He will remove every trace of disgrace that his people have suffered throughout the world. For the Lord Yahweh has promised it. Man, isn't that a good prophecy? It's going to come to pass. See, our King, our Messiah, our Savior will come and return for us soon and very soon. Now, for those of you who've experienced tragedy and trauma, silence and darkness, maybe the loss of a loved one, and maybe the sounds of Christmas joy have been replaced by silence, I want to tell you today another prophecy. One day, 
in the twinkling of an eye. That silence will be shattered by the sound of the archangel blowing the trumpet. And the Son of Man will rend the heavens and he's going to come down and gather us up together with him. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And this body, this corruptible body will put on incorruptible. And this mortal flesh will put on immortality. And we shall be changed. And we're going to say together, death, where is your victory? Hell, where's your sting? And he's going to gather us together under his mighty right hand and take us to heaven. Where, as Isaiah said, he'll wipe away every tear from every eye. He'll remove every trace of shame, of guilt, of sadness, or of loss. Not even the faintest memory will remain. Joy and light and life forever will be ours. So let us have hope in our salvation. Yes, the world is dark, but listen, the darkness cannot overcome the light. He's already been defeated. Amen. Maybe it seems that heaven's become silent in your life. Well, the Holy Spirit would say to you, the fullness of time is drawing near. And the silence in your life is about to be shattered. God's plans have never failed As we said before, he's never lost a battle, and he's not even about to start. We've read the back of the book, and we know who wins. So this Christmas season, I challenge you to fix your eyes on Jesus. If he authored your faith, he's going to finish it, y'all. He's going to finish. He's not going to leave you high and dry. He's not going to leave you hanging. He authored your faith. He's going to finish it, and he's never lost a battle. You are victorious already because of the Christmas story. Amen? Amen. Will you look at this next step with me? I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. He will shatter the silence in my life. Would you all bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a moment? I ended a little bit early today because I wanted to do something. The Holy Spirit prompted me that there may be people in this room that there's silence in your life because you don't know God. So how can you experience his joy and his praises and his life if you don't know him? And today I want to give you an opportunity to know him. And here's the second opportunity I want to give, and I believe this applies to somebody specifically today. that you were once in father's house and like the prodigal son you went and you did your own thing and made your own way I like to say it like this you made Jesus your savior but not your lord and you left father's house and said I'm going to live life the way I want to live it but you found yourself dining with the pigs in the slop and in the muck and the mire and the silence And Father would say to you, come back to my house. He's wooing you. He's beckoning you. He's calling you today to come back to Father's house. You know, here's the thing about the father and the prodigal son story. He didn't wait for the son to clean up. He didn't make him bathe first, shower, and get all that pig slop off of him. No, the Bible says when he saw the son from afar off, he ran to him. And he embraced him. And he said, welcome home, my son, whom I thought was dead, is alive. And he welcomed him back into Father's house. And he prepared a feast for him. If that is you today, and you've gone from Father's house, you don't need to get your life right, right now. You don't need to clean up to be accepted by Father. You just need to come on home. You just need to come to him and say, God, here I am in all my mess, in all my problems. And he'll embrace you. And he'll say, welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. Come enjoy the life that I have for you. I'll cleanse you. I'll make you whole again. I'll free you from the trauma and the drama, the addiction and the silence. And I'll bring light and life into your life again. If either of those are you today, if you've never known God or you want to come back to Father's house, would you raise your hand for me? Would you raise your hand so that I can see that you want to come back? I see them. Thank you. Raise them high. I'm not going to make you come down today, but I do want you to be bold enough to say, this is me. 
I want to come to Father's house. And I'm bold enough that I'll raise up my hand and I'll say, Jesus, here I am. Take me back to Father's house. I'm bold and I say I need you. Thank you for those of you who raised your hand. Let's pray this together. Everyone pray this with me. But if your hand is raised, pray this out with your heart, okay? Say, Father God, I come before you today. Forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me of unrighteousness. Take me as I am and make me new. Jesus, thank you for coming for me. Thank you for being born for me. Thank you for dying for me. And thank you for being raised up from the dead and raising me with you into a new life of freedom, of power, and of joy. Thank you for saving me today. Thank you for welcoming me back into Father's house. I love you, Jesus. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Man, can we hear it for those people that, that raised their hand and pray that today? Man. Thank you. I'm, oh, I'm telling y'all, your life's about to change. The silence is going to be shattered. The silence was just shattered. Let me say it that way. In your life, that darkness has been broken. God has a plan for you, and it's a special plan, and you're going to see it come to pass. Ah, the anointing's so strong on that. You've been broken. You've been dining with the pigs. God's going to raise you up to dine with kings. He's going to raise you up to a new level in your life. He's got so much for you today. Ah, don't you just love God? Don't you just love the Father? Isn't he so good? For those of you who raised your hand and prayed that prayer, before you go today, I want to let you know we've got a book for you out here at the end of these doors. It's about knowing Christ, and it'll help you on your journey. And I want to, I want to encourage you, please do this. Please fill out a Connect card. Because here's what happens. When you don't fill out a Connect card, we don't know who you are. This body of believers here, we are your family now. We are your safety net and your covering. Because if you just go out there in life, I promise you, the parable of the sower tells us Satan will come and try to steal the seed and take away what happened here today. But if you'll fill out that Connect card and put it in the offering box, We'll have your contact info. We'll follow up with you and we'll be your safety net and we'll help you on this journey to into Christ and his life that he has for you. Amen. Would you all rise and stand with me today? On your way out, if you've got a tithe or an offering, you can drop those in the offering box. Aren't you glad that he shattered the silence? Aren't you glad that darkness is broken? Amen. I'm going to speak a blessing over you. You're the head and not the tail. You're above only and you're never beneath. You are God's sons and daughters. The silence is shattered in your life. The darkness is broken in your life. Every prophecy, every word, every dream that God has put in your heart shall be fulfilled. I declare in Jesus' name, you are victorious. And you go forth this week in victory and by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you. This week, point someone to the path. I'll see you next week for Christmas Eve. God bless you.